Thank you for coming to this uh, late lecture. This is the IAS, we call it Groundbreaking Science Lecture. That means the speakers have done some groundbreaking science, you know, to be invited to give this lecture. And uh, Professor Tan is the sixth in the series. Okay, there will be more to come. And the last one we had was uh, two, two days ago. Huh? And the lecture room was full because it was held at 4.30. Today we hold it at 6.30. is because today's lecture actually is done in conjunction with the Singapore National Institute of Chemistry of which Prof Tan is the president. And then we wanted to allow time, you know, because he has got many members who don't uh, work in NTU, so we thought we'd give them time to come, you know. But uh, we also have some faculty members who work very long hours, <laughs> who stay back to attend this lecture, okay? But let me tell you a story. Uh, one of my hobbies is working on edible bird's nest, okay? And then, of course, when you do any piece of research, you go back, you know, to the literature as far back as possible to see, see who, is, who has done the work. And then I was shocked. The first person to have published in a good journal on edible bird's nest was a lady by the name of Chi Che Wang. And she did her PhD at University of Chicago, that's where I did my PhD too. <laughs> huh? But I was trying to look for a photograph of Chiche Wang. It turned out that Chiche Wang was the first female faculty, Chinese faculty member for an American university. She, was, she later on she became a professor at Northwestern University. Okay? And in those days, that was back in 1921 when she published her paper, you know. In those days, to be a woman uh, doing a PhD in science is quite rare, very rare indeed, you know. But if you look at her papers, there's only one author, her alone, you know. No name of her thesis. Her uh, supervisor was like a mentor to her only, you know. She did all the work by herself. In addition to working on bird nest, she also worked on the century egg pitan, you know. Interesting, you know, these two uh, material uh, Chinese delic food delicacies. Huh? And she did her PhD on that. Huh? She published in Journal of Biological Chemistry huh? on her own. And later on, she moved into nutrition science huh? and human nutrition. And she made a name for herself. And today in Chicago, there's a park named after her called Chi Che Wang Park. If you go to Chicago on the south side, you see this park in her honor, you know. So she has done a good, good, good uh, uh, had a good career in Chicago and contributed a lot to the community. The way, the reason why I bring her name up is because when I look further into the history, she was a very active academic. And she used to have uh, research meetings at 8 p.m. <laughs> once a week. 8 p.m. You know, at 8 p.m., I think most universities are deserted. But at 8 p.m., she had her meetings. Uh, and there were a group of uh, female scientists, you know, who attended those meetings. So that's where they get their ideas, uh, research ideas. So holding late meetings uh, should become the norm, you know, in a good university, all right? <laughs> 6.30 is still early. <laughs> okay, now back to uh, Professor Tan Chun Hong. Uh, I poached him from NUS. I, he got his uh, first degree BSc honors first class from NUS, graduated in 1995. And then because he was a government scholar, he had to work for one year, right? Uh, in the civil service Custom. or the custom, okay? Self and then he went to Cambridge to do his PhD. And after he completed his PhD in what, 2009, all right? He, he came to NUS, he wanted a job. Huh? Uh, he didn't realize that our standards at that time had already risen quite high. 
you know. So because he's Singaporean and then he did well academically, so I told hey, Chun Hong, I keep a job for you, but you must go and do a postdoc. Remember? Huh? Uh, he was one of those, and then uh, Ha Hui was the other one. Huh? And then the third one was Lo Kian Ping, the three of you, you know. So at that time, Lo Kian Ping today, you know, is in charge of the Graphene Center in NUS. Huh? He's uh, made a big name for himself. And then Ha Hui is now the director of the Genome Institute of Singapore. You know, so they should thank me for making life a little bit difficult for them at that point in time, you know. But I sent them away for a postdoc at the same time. I told them, but the job I keep for you, I will give you uh, how much? I gave you some allowance, right? I remember. Huh? I gave them allowance. They didn't realize that their allowance was actually for me to buy in them. <laughs> because if they do well in their postdoc, they will disappear from Singapore. <laughs> Okay, so that was what I did in those days. You see, in those days, there I was dean of science. Those days, the dean of science very powerful, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do, I can do just with a signature. Huh? And today, of course, the chairs have got no power, <laughs> or very little power. I don't understand why, you know. Huh? <laughs> but in those days, that was back in uh, around 2005. Huh? So after he completed his uh, postdoc at Harvard, uh, one of the top school uh, you did in Harvard campaign did it in uh, NIMS in Tokyo and then I think Hafu also did it in Harvard yes. uh, okay so the three of them all of them doing very well now you know but you know when I first joined the National University of Singapore I was like the early one or probably the first one in a long while you know to come back with a postdoctoral experience uh, Earlier on, all those faculty members, the moment you finish your PhD, you can get a job. He thought he could do the same. <laughs> I changed the rules. <laughs> okay? So, by changing the rules, the university came out much faster. Huh? All right? So, after completing his PhD, he joined NUS as, uh, at that time, was a lecturer, was it? Uh, oh, assistant professor already. Uh. When I joined as assistant professor, but on the way there, I think there was some... Like a tutor position or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you were called a senior tutor because I gave you some money. Yeah. You know? <laughs> huh? That's inverted comma because we, uh, we officially I'm a postdoc there. Yeah, yeah, you're officially a postdoc. Huh? But you're so happy, you know, receiving about thousand something dollars of me at that time. <laughs> I was also very happy because I bind them. <laughs> they don't know. Huh? Okay, so after that, he uh, oh he did his uh, un, uh, un honest project with uh, Lo Tepeng. Yeah. Okay, and Lo Tepeng was our first uh, groundbreaking science lecturer. Huh? He won the National Science Award this year. Huh? So uh, he rose to become associate professor in NUS, and then after he got his tenure, I took him over. Huh? And then the rest is history. Lah. Uh -huh. So today, he is the acting chair of the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences. I hope he gets confirmed as chair. Lah. I don't know who he's acting for. <laughs> okay? All right. So he's also, he is now promoted to a full professor in uh, 2016. He's also concurrently director for the CN Young Scholars Program. And of course, president of the Singapore National Institute of Chemistry. So... Uh, this evening, he's going to share with us his uh, groundbreaking research, uh, supposed to be another kind of SN2 reaction. Huh? But uh, he will talk about his pet topic as well, huh? guanidine and guanidium as catalyst. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Prof. Lee, for the introduction. Um, when Professor Lee asks you to deliver a lecture, um, I have no choice but to agree. So, <laughs> um, I'm very privileged to be invited to give uh, a lecture organized by IAS. Um, and of course, very thankful for the very kind introduction. In fact, in my entire career, I basically was, or I basically applied for a job twice, but both times it's actually not really applied, but, but 
you know, and twice the, um, the person giving me the job is actually Prof Lee. <laughs> In fact, twice I didn't really apply because I really, I just asked him and I said, okay, come. <laughs> so, so very, very uh, fortunate to have uh, Prof Lee. Okay. It, in my life, so basically he's my uh, not not just mentor, a super mentor. Okay, so a trick in your career is to find your own uh, super mentor. Okay, that will support your career. Um, the reason the reason why I changed the title is because I don't really want to um, allow this our recent paper to really uh, distract us from uh, the whole scenario because I really much like to uh, discuss that reaction in the context of our whole program. Um, because if I just talk about the, the single paper, um, I don't think you can see the full, full spectrum of the things that we are doing and also you may get lost of why we end up uh, making that discovery. And you may think that, oh yeah, it's just a lucky break or something, you know. Of course, it's lucky for us to get that, that, that reaction. But then uh, it's better for us to see it as the entirety. So uh, the, the seminar this evening would be kind of broken up into three parts. I think the first part it will be to really review uh, the history of the, of the field that I'm in and, and, and how we play a role uh, in this area. And the second part then we talk a bit more about the recent discovery of very interesting SN2X reaction. And then I'll end off by talking about a, a concept that we're developing as well, uh, using the kind of catalyst uh, that we're, we're making. Okay, without further, I think uh, let's, let's start it. Um, if you kind of discuss about homogeneous catalysis nowadays, it can be kind of broadly classified into three different types. I think the first would be uh, enzymes, still the very best uh, catalyst evolved to millions of years of uh, uh, nature. Okay. And then the other category will be those consisting of uh, metals. I think this area is as old as chemistry itself. You know, when the early people that were working on uh, chemistry, when they, when they add, add, added some uh, metal salts and the reaction goes faster, okay, so maybe more than 200 years old. And the latest one is really called organocatalysis, which has seen a revival around the year 2000. It's kind of like almost, almost about 20 years old now. And how's the difference between these three branches? How are they different? So enzymes are huge structures, high molecular weight polypeptides. They often work in low concentration environment with very high turnover number. And they can break very strong chemical bonds under ambient temperature and they often work in a, uh, an aqueous environment. Okay, metal, cat met metal catalase on the other hand typically work in high concentration organic solvent environment. It has typically high turnover number, but not as high as the enzymes. They are low molecular weight. Of course, they contain active metal species. And a lot of time, their reactivity uh, is modulated by the kind of ligand that is surrounding it. And the last category, the organocatalysis, it's actually low molecular weight, uh, very often just as small as one single amino acid. Um, typically, it utilizes non-covalent interaction in its transition state to lower the energy uh, of the transition state to allow the ca uh, catalyst to, uh, catalysis to occur very much like the, the enzyme. It's kind of like a mini, 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 mini enzyme. Okay? And Typically working in organic solvents also, but it can also survive and work well in equal solvents. Equal solvents is also possible, or a mixture of two. So these are the three broad categories. And before I go further, I want 
to share with you a quite a special functional group called the gonadin. You may have seen it before, but, but it doesn't hit you. But let me put it into the whole context. The easiest way to understand this functional group is actually the amino acid arginine. And the side chain of the amino acid arginine is actually gonadine. And under physiological conditions, it's often, it's often protonated. So it's charged. And often the function of this charge group is to form salt bridge with, say, a carboxylic acid of another peptide side chain. And then it's responsible for the three dimensional structure of the, the enzymes or the protein. Now, guanidine or the conjugate acid guanidinium can be found in a variety of other compounds. For example, it is known structure in many uh, drugs. For example, this, this guy, uh, famotidine, is an antihistamine, or the conjugated guanidine can be found as an anti-diabetic drug or an anti-malaria drug. In fact, guanidinium, the, the smallest form of guanidine, the guanidinium hydrochloride, is actually a drug by itself used for uh, some kind of uh, uh, muscle degeneration, you know, to, to treat mu muscle de degener degeneration disease. Go just simple guadinium hydrochloride. And it's also present, the gu guadinium is, or guanidine is also present in many natural products. Uh, those, those that have been to Japan may have taken the, uh, the fish, the puffer fish called fugu. It's actually a delicacy, it's actually a, um, expensive and, and every year several people die in Japan eating fugu. And the, the thing that kills the, 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 you know, the person is actually this toxin called uh, teratoxin and it's con containing the guadinium uh, group here. And lots of famous chemists have done the total synthesis of this compound. In the 19... 80s and early 1990s, there are actually many supramolecular chemists interested in the design of chiral guadinium groups and use it to do some kind of gas host recognition complexes. And the one that is shown here is actually a chiral guadinium recognizing uh, L-tryptophan. So, so if you give it a mixture of L and D tryptophan, this chirogonadine guadinium can only recognize the, the L tryptophan, forming a complex uh, with it. And, and the, one of the very important paper, uh, you know, at the onset of, our, our, of, our, of, of us being independent group, okay, I think Jackson will remember this, this paper. It's the paper by Nobel Prize winner E.J. Corey. Okay. Uh, he showed that this 5,5 bicyclic gonadine uh, can be used to catalyze the structural reaction between imine and hydrogen cyanide. So the addition of CN onto this imine bond to form this with good use and good EE. So this is a very important paper for us. Okay. So this paper is we were, were very much inspired uh, by this paper. But when we started, Professor Corey only published two papers with this catalyst, and then he stopped for many years. So we thought that we could follow up on what he left off. Okay, so, so organocatalysis, organocatalysis can be kind of broadly classified into, there's many ways of classifying organocatalysis, but we can broadly classify into Bronsted base, Bronsted acid, Lewis base, and Lewis acid. And since 2010, actually, the number of papers in this area has rocketed. And there's not an issue now in most organic or, or most chemistry journals that don't have a paper every week or every other week describing advances in organocatalysis. Um, there are, there are actually several groups in Singapore that are interested. In NUS, there's a Professor Lee, uh, not Lee, uh, Louis Singh that is mostly working on uh, primary amino acids. 
at all chirophosphines, uh, and that can be classified under uh, Lewis base. Uh, in our this building, Professor Robin Chi is very famous for his carbine work, which who can be also classified under Lewis base. And then there used to be this Professor Yang Ying Yang in NUS who is doing chiral sulfur catalyst, but now he's moved to Chinese University of Hong Kong, and of course our own group. So our own group specializes in using bron and doing bronsted base, using guanadine as bronsted base catalyst. So this is um, the timeline. So, so 2000 is the watershed year for organic catalysis. A lot of chemistry happened around that year and it's got breakthrough, you know. And then we came on, we started our work in 2003. And at that time, I was evaluating because no work was done in bronsted acid and bronsted base. So we were choosing between acid or base and in the end, we decided to do uh, bases. And then in 2005, we are one of the first few groups that published in bronsted base and, and went into the area strongly. Okay, so that's the context of where we came from. And over these 15 years or so, we have kind of developed three categories of catalysts. The first is inspired by Professor E.J. Corey. We used this 5.5 by second bronadine and showed that it can be a very general bronsted base catalyst. So almost nine years or so in NUS was simply just doing that. Showing guanadine is a general base catalyst. Full stop. Okay, we published like stacks and stack of paper, you know, on that. And since coming to NTU, we have shifted gear a little bit. Okay, working mostly on the guanadinium salts, two types, of which the pentanidium we mostly use it for phase transfer catalysis, and bisguanadinium for ion pair catalysis. But this is just arbitrary because we have found vice, vice versa in which this coordinate can be used for phase transfer reaction and this guy can be used for ampere. But this is a very arbitrary arrangement, but later on I'll explain it a bit further. Okay, so a little bit of history. I'm gonna condense nine, year, nine years of chemistry into just two slides. Okay. <laughs> so, so what's so special about a bronsted base catalyst? I think the niche reaction for a bronsted base reaction is simply to move proton, which is one of the smallest group in, in, in catalysis or in, 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 in synthetic chemistry. You take that proton and you move it around the, the chemical system in a very specific, you know, very chemical selective, regio selective, and endo selective manner. Very specific control of proton. And this is a very good example because, because this bronsted base catalyst grab the proton from here. This is an alkanoid, pK about 9. It pulled this guy and then returned this proton three carbons away. One, two, three, in a one, three proton shift reaction. Take from here, put there. But in that process, it generated a chiral aline. And you can see there's nothing else. Just catalyst, solvent, starting material, product, finish, nothing. So it's one of the this one of my personal favorite. That's why it's there amongst amongst the, all the reaction that we found, and we just want to put this as representative of nine years' work. Okay. So it's one of my favorite reactions. Okay. And we thought for some time, how can we use this kind of very, you know, reaction? How, how do we use this reaction? So one of, one of the ways of using this reaction is to generate this aline within the chemical system in C2. And then through some tether or something, place a diene on the other side of the molecule. And then once the aline is formed, then we undergo intramolecular use of the reaction. Okay? And when you have designed some specific tether or so, you can generate bicyclic ring system 
and when you have a, some special design tether, you can achieve hydroisoquinoline. And if you see this two ring structure, it is very similar to this, you know, DE ring of this natural product called Yohimbin. And then we use this strategy, main strategy, key step to complete the total synthesis of alpha Yohimbin. The rest of our step is actually boring because it's kind of similar to the other reports uh, by, uh, by other colleagues. Okay, so only this step uh, is key and, and, and mainly designed by us. Okay, if you're interested, you can just pull out this paper to read. For those in, uh, okay. For many, many years, we, we use it as a bronsted base and, and we, ne we never thought of using it as a ligand for metal catalyst reaction until, until a few years ago. <laughs> so, we, and, and the reason why we do that is because we found a very interesting reaction in the literature. This is a commercial available ammonium cuprate. And we found that under a phase transfer condition, which is uh, 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 aqueous potassium carbonate, we found that this condition can promote allylic alkylation reaction. You can see that it works very well under phase, phase transfer. So this is a metal, but it can work in the aqueous environment. So we were wondering how we could make a chiral version of this. So we thought that if we use, we, if we swap this ammonium with a, a, a chiral guadinium and some kind of cuprate species, then we can uh, achieve a chiral version. So what we did was to use guadinium chloride and then mix it with copper one chloride and we were able to get this guadinium cuprate. Then we mix, okay, we managed to get an X-ray crystal structure of this guy and you can see that it's very nice, complex and then we use this and then we put it into the same condition and we can see that the reaction proceeded uh, smoothly with good EE and with good yield. So, after many years, this go of, of cycle, we basically proved that gu guanidine and guadinium can also be a ligand for metal catalyzed reaction. Okay, so, so that's ended the first part about bisectic guanidine. If you are interested uh, in this topic, there are a couple of reviews. Uh, you can go on and, and read them. Um, especially the first one is uh, very well cited, but it's a little bit outdated. Uh, Jackson in the audience who wrote this with me when he was... Uh, PhD students or undergrad, PhD. And now we are writing a second version of it, uh, the updated version after 10 years. So this year is two, 2019. So I think in a few months, one, two months, we can probably send out this paper. And Christina is also helping with the writing of the update of this uh, paper now. So, so it's a 10 year update, okay? Uh, uh, update version of this paper, okay? So, so let me end the first part of the, um, of the story about bisectic gonadine and bronsted based catalysis. Just before we move to NTU, uh, you know, we became actually quite bored with the bronsted based chemistry because you know it, it, it was it was getting very easy for us to publish paper <laughs> because we got this catalyst system, we got this we this get this catalyst that works very well, you know. Then every day the student, I mean every day, you know, students trying different reaction and it works and I publish paper. It was getting super boring for us. Okay, so is it? Yeah. Okay, because you may not believe it, but publishing paper is not our aim in the lab. Okay, actually there are many papers that we don't publish and we just just put it aside to the wrath of my students. <laughs> okay, so, um, at that time, there, you know, 
we were thinking about something else. We were saying that, okay, how can we make the catalyst stronger in a sense that it becomes a, a more basic catalyst? If you, have, if you have a more basic catalyst, the kind of chemistry you can do expanded, right? You can, because you can abstract weaker protons and the chemistry uh, expands. And the basic, basic idea means that, you know, how do we create a super base? And there are several groups around the world at that time that, that we are comparator with, including very famous people, right? Uh, Professor Tarada from Tohoku University, Professor Oi from Nagoya University, you know, Dixon from Oxford, and Lambert from Columbia. So a couple of guys will just say, okay, who can make the most active super base catalyst? And each of them have their own design and so on. So we are kind of in the competition. Okay? And our own naive idea is just simply to kind of add further conjugation. So if you add conjugation, and when this catalyst pull a proton, it becomes the charge becomes more spread out across more atoms and it becomes more stable, right? If it gets more stable, then it's a stronger base. Okay, so very simple idea. So we went on to make this catalyst, um, but very soon we found that it's actually not more basic. Uh, we got an x-ray of a very of a related compound, and once I saw the x-ray, it kind of hit me already. Ah, okay, I understand why. Okay, the reason is because the five nitrogen on our design is actually not flat because of the steric is orthogonal. If we made a flat, you know, uh, pentanidine, it would be a very strong base. Okay, I asked I asked some students to, to do it, but 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 I wasn't very. I, we didn't force that direction a lot. The main reason, of course, there's any one of you that is interested to do, you are, you are still very welcome to try. I'm sure it'll work, okay? But we got distracted by something else. We totally not moved that in that direction because we got distracted. The reason we got distracted was we found that if we alkylate everything, we got a guadinium salt. And, and this guadalupe salt becomes a very active phase transfer catalyst. Okay? And we try it on a very normal, okay, a very common phase transfer reaction, which is the glycinate shift phase addition to alpha, beta, and saturated ketone. And the U was great, and EE is great, blah, blah, blah. But it's not the main reason why we are excited. The main reason we are excited is just because if you look at the catalyst loading, 0 0.05 more percent is actually very low. In fact, the best catalyst loading that we ever re recorded for this catalyst for us is 0 0.02 more percent. And it is a real catalyst, okay? Compared to the, the first category, the one that we did for 10 years or 9 years, right? The loading sometimes is 10 more percent. So turnover number is just 10. Right? Basically, the catalyst just do 10 times. Actually, very, very slow catalyst. This is a, actually a lot faster uh, catalyst. Okay? Before I go further, I really want to kind of explain the, the idea, you know, or, or, or the thing. Because I'm going to use this a few times more. And I want to kind of like stop here for a moment to really explain to you what's a phase transfer catalyst. Okay, so in a phase transfer reaction, the catalyst is kind of like Q, a cation, and what it does is to carry the reagent, which is Y, which is in a salt form, and dissolve in water, and to carry this reagent into the organic phase, the catalyst Q, carry the reagent Y into the organic phase and allow it to do reaction and then generate the new uh, 
product, sorry, sorry, it carry X, I'm sorry, it carry X, okay, this is the, sorry, it carry X, this is the salt, it carry X, goes into the organic phase, undergo the reaction and create the product, and then Y is a side product that you didn't want, which then is returned by the catalyst into the water phase. So what the catalyst does is two function, right? It takes the reagent, goes into the organic phase, does reaction, and then carry the waste into the aqueous phase. It's, it's a beautiful idea, right? So in, at any time in the organic phase, you will have very little reagent and also very little waste. And at the end of the reaction, the waste is just in the water phase and just separate away. So it's a very clean concept for organic reaction. And it's a very powerful concept for organic reaction. So we found that our catalyst is a very excellent phase transfer catalyst and we then began to explore reactions again. And, and because of time today, I'll also just show you one example. Right, the one that I picked is this one. Sulfate and iron is actually a very unstable reaction intermediate. And we found that we can generate this unstable intermediate in C2. Okay, using this pentanidium catalyst that we just discovered. And then allow it to undergo sulfur alkylation to get this heterocyclic sulfide. Again, with good data and good yield. How does this chemistry work? The chemistry works by under phase transfer basic condition, it, this proton gets pulled off, generates the enolate, and it undergo retro micro reaction, ta -da 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 -da, and then speed up a molecule of acrylate, and this is the sulfonate, and then this sulfonate undergo sulfur alkylation reaction. Having the right kind of catalyst is very important for this reaction, both in terms of selectivity and residual selectivity and so on. I will explain in a moment why choosing the right catalyst is very important. Because during the optimization of this uh, catalyst, you can see that this is a catalyst, the pentanidium system, and there are four R groups, and each of the R group is actually a benzyl group with two tributyl bulky group. And in the meta position, there's an X. You see that when the X is changed from H, chloro, bromo, iodine, and O methoxy, you can change different kind of groups. And we found that uh, as we change to halogen, the enantial selectivity improved. Here I didn't put the yield. Both the enantial selectivity and yield improved in that direction. Why is that so? So when we change the catalyst, the, the catalyst becomes better. Why? The main reason is because the halogen on the side chain of the catalyst is actually important in stabilizing the transition state of the reaction. And in this case, you see here, this is a sulfonic anion, right? This sulfur oxygen is a sulfonic anion. And this is the benzyl bromide that allowing the sulfur to attack the benzyl bromide and to create a product, right? You can see that the halogen, which is the iodine, is actually stabilizing the BR of the benzyl bromide. This is a very important halogen bonding which stabilizes the transition state. I think from this moment onward, we began to be kind of interested in halogen bond stabilized systems. Okay. Okay. So with the stage is set, we will discuss the recent discovery. Uh, that, 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 that we found. So now you know uh, phase one reaction, you know, chiral cations and then halogen bond stabilized systems. Re now we are ready to discuss uh, 
this recent discovery. And one slide before we go into the main thing, and that's two reactions that you learn when you're an un when you're undergraduate in maybe even like if you're from NTU, you're you know CM1101, right? <laughs> These two reactions. I hope you don't forget SM1 and SM2 reaction. Who has forgot? Who has forgotten SM1 and SM2 reaction? <laughs> okay. So one a quick revision. Okay. So SM1 reaction. Okay. Basically, this is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. Okay. A textbook reaction that everybody has to study as an undergraduate. SM1 reaction generally generally is generated from tertiary halides, right? That generate tertiary bromides. And you generate a carbocat ion and it needs to be stabilized by R1, R2, R3 and typically cannot have beta hydrogen. Why? If you have a beta hydrogen, it typically just loses a proton and it becomes an alkene, right? Okay, so that's SM1 reaction. I hope it's slowly coming back, right? <laughs> you have returning all this to your professors already, right? Okay. So how about SN2 reaction? Okay, SN2 reaction generally works well only for primary halide, poorly for secondary halides, and almost never for tertiary halides. Why? Because it is an backside reaction, right? I remember when I was uh, an undergraduate, okay, I can't remember who taught me actually. <laughs> the professor always say, oh, you must draw this pentacoordinated coordinated transition state. If you don't draw this thing, you will get only half the mark. That, that statement stuck in my head until today, right? He keeps saying like 10, 20 times, 30 times, you must draw this thing, backside attack, and penta coordinated, okay? Or else you get zero mark, <laughs> or, or half the mark or something, okay? So SN2 reaction is the backside attack. And because of that, if you have a tertiary halide, it's actually very crowded for the nucleophile to approach from behind because you get groups that's banging in. No matter how you try to squeeze in, you 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 you, you can't hit the 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 sigma star, right? You can't hit the sigma star bond. Okay, good. So let's talk about our reaction. We were investigating thio carboxylates okay addition to tertiary bromide and using pentanidine you know under side kind of phase transfer condition we were able to get extremely high u and ee for this kind of uh, thioesters so obviously we are very excited and delighted that we found this reaction um, in the first glance, can you tell me whether it's an SN1 or SN2 reaction? Very difficult, right? In the first glance, you know, one minute, right? If you have, if you have studied uh, CM1101, you will say, ah, maybe very difficult, right? SN1, okay, if it's, if it's a carbocat ion, then uh, most likely it's, it's, it's going to you know, the, the protonate and then uh, you get LK and then you get everything messed up, right? If it's an SN2 reaction, okay? If it's an SN2 reaction, this is a racemic compound and then this guy attack, da -da, da -da, then it should be a kinetic resolution reaction. Then you get half of this guy and half of the starting bromo. Right, of course, we use half the reagent and then we tested, no. It's a very nice, perfect reaction. Beautiful reaction, okay? But when we are doing this, we're actually not surprised. The reason is because we are actually trying to look for or hunt for, we are hunting 
apple actually, then we get orange. Okay, so it's kind of an unexpected surprise, bonus. We're actually hunting for SRN1 reaction. What's the SRN1 reaction? It's a, it's a quite rare reaction also. We're actually hunting for this reaction. We were thinking about an organic reagent that can do a single electron transfer. So or organic reagent transferring to the tertiary bromide generate a radical anion and then kicks out X minus to form a radical species, a tertiary radical species. Then, this tertiary radical species attack the nucleophile to generate a new radical anion. And then, this guy do an electron transfer to the another molecule of this guy. And then, the cycle continue. So, we are actually hunting for the SRN1 reaction. If we have gotten this, we are actually happy also. But something happened. <laughs> Two things happened. One is our computational partner, our friend, uh, Dr. Richmond Lee from SUTD, you know, he was trying to calculate for us for a long time. And then he tells us he faced some difficulty. I was so sure, you know, we are kind of like, I was pushing him. Oi, Make it happen. Please calculate SIN1 and tell me it's okay. Like, you know, kind of like give him a please fit into this model that I draw. Basically, I draw for you already. Okay, calculate this. It must work. So I was just pushing him to calculate this. He said, no, 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 no. The main thing was this step. The radical adding a nucleophile the energy is actually quite high. And you realize that our chemistry occurs at minus 50 degrees. So Rich, Richmond was saying, ah, the barrier is high. I think I can't remember how many kilocal. I think I think 60 or 70. Uh, it doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't seem to work at low temperature reaction, right? <laughs> Cannot be, you know. I was saying, ah, can you shift here and there? Okay, okay. So so computational, we, we face a problem. And then later on, we tested experimentally. Okay, not in this order, but eventually we found a good way to do this. To cut long story short, short basically, when we added additive in the reaction, and two categories, these three, per, these three guy, four guy, is actually a hydrogen atom transfer reagent. The last three guys, methanol, water, and phenol, are what? Are proton donors. So two, two types. Hydrogen atom donors and proton donors. When you add the hydrogen atom donor, nothing happened. Okay, everything, the product is A is still obtained. Don't have quenching, rage, uh, don't have quenching products. But when you add proton donors, da, 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 the product almost gone, much reduced. You get B, a lot of B. So a very simple experiment. You put proton source, the cause of reaction change. When you add hydrogen atom acceptor, not much change. So very simple conclusion. It's not a radical reaction. It is an anion reaction. Some kind of anionic species is, is there. So we do further tests. This is the Hammer plot. Okay. This is a log of the reaction rate between this guy, here and with other species containing different functional groups. Okay, a, a lot of the relative rate of the reaction. And then you get a positive uh, slope, a row. This kind of positive slope simply signify that there is an 
negative charge generating in the transition state. Because in a negative charge that's generated in the transition state, a more electron withdrawing substrate will stabilize that anion and will make the reaction faster. So we can see, you know, if you have slightly electron withdrawing group, the reaction becomes faster than those that are electron donating. Okay, so this is a very good plot to show that there's an ionic species inside your reaction. So the ultimate test, you have a mixture of a tertiary bromide containing R group and then another species just containing the proton. If it is a radical reaction, a radical form here will grab any H and then the, the reaction just die. But if it's an N ion reaction, it generates an N ion, then this N ion can pull this proton, right? And then you get a mixture of different kinds of carbon ion, and you should get a mixture of products. And exactly what we saw, kind of mixture of products. Okay, so all these da, 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 point to just one thing: there is carbon ion or N ion generated in the reaction. So how does this N ion become to be? Then we have to propose some very bold proposal, right? Crazy idea, right? We have to start to propose crazy idea uh, that that. It's crazy, right? <laughs> crazy idea. So what's this crazy idea? The crazy idea is now then maybe the nucleophile attack the bromine from the front, right? So it sounds like crazy, okay? If 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 we when, if we talk to someone a year more than a year ago, they say, ah, uh, okay, some nucleophile can attack the CX bond from the front. I think everyone will say, Xiao ah, crazy, you know, including myself, I'll just say that if a student tell me, ah, you're crazy, <laughs> you never study basic chemistry, okay, don't, don't, don't tell me this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> okay, I think Kenjo will say the same thing, right? <laughs> you'll just tell a student, you go back and study your textbook, okay, you're wrong, okay? But a year later now, okay, it becomes possible to make that conversation, okay? So we propose, it's actually at attacking from the front and breaks this CBR bond here and generate a carbon ion. And to generate a new species, a, a sulfonyl bromide. And then this N ion in the presence of proton additive, right? When you have proton additive, it gets quenched and you get this product. Okay, we saw this branch. Okay? And then once this sulfonyl bromide intermediate is formed, then this carbon ion can attack this intermediate in two ways. One, it attacks the bromine again, and then it goes back to the starting material. If it attacks the sulfur, you get the product. So the first part is reversible. That is the reason why, even though this is a racemic mixture, you get one compound because the first part of the reaction is reversible. And only this part is controlled by the catalyst to get the, the compound that you want. So that's why it ends up as one compound. There is another possibility of another molecule of the uh, uh, thiol carboxylate attacking this species to get to this dithiol species. Indeed, if we look closely into our reaction system, we actually saw a very, very small amount of this compound. So, we, so finally, what is the test of the, you know, what's, what's the saying? The test of pudding, or the, 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 the ultimate test is to eat the pudding or something, right? And so we went on to make this intermediate. We are proposing this intermediate, so we make the intermediate we throw the salt form, okay, and mix these two, and we using the catalyst, and we found that we can get the product. Essentially, we kind of prove that this is the intermediate, and actually, the the front attack is possible. 
Of course, when we found, we, when we proposed all this, uh, this is the Richmond from SUTD. Um, he's much happier, right? <laughs> because when we give him the new proposal and he starts to calculate, okay, it makes a lot more sense now. Okay? Then he found this intermediate B, which is the pre transient state species. Okay, one step before the transition state, he found this intermediate in which the the catalyst is stabilizing both the nucleophile and electrophile. And he saw that the thiocarboxylate thio thio sulfur is actually stabilized through a halogen bonding. The sulfur is stabilizing with the bromide, M3 M strong. So this is a very stable uh, pre intermediate before the transition state. So, what I keep saying hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding, but what is hydrogen bonding? Okay, so another slide for you, a revision slide for everyone. What is a hydrogen bonding? Okay, this is a hydrogen bond donor, which is a, a compound containing a halide, and a hydrogen bond acceptor. If you replace the X with H, you're actually getting a hydrogen bonding model. So hydrogen bond is actually similar to hydrogen bond. It's actually directional also, and the strength can be very similar. Several kilocal per mole. But sometimes it's, that few kilocal is actually enough to stabilize the transient state of many reactions. Then you will ask me, I thought halogen should be electron rich. How can you put a delta plus here, right? Proton, you know, is delta plus, right? Electron poor. But how can a halogen be electron poor? I use this few species to demonstrate this. Okay, there are four compounds here: CF4, CF3 chloride, and bromide and iodide. As you can see, as the halogen gets bigger. Like especially from bromine onwards, the electron density is actually not distributed equally on the atom. You can see that in the equatorial region, there is actually more electron density. At the apical point or at, at, at the peak, there's actually an area of poor electron density. And we call this the sigma hole. So even though the halogen is in general electron rich, the distribution is not equal, and that actually it created a special area right in the front that is electron poor. So that allows for halogen bonding to occur. Okay, so now I'm gonna end off how long have I spoken? More than an hour already, is it? One hour already. Okay, I still are tired. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I have still got a chunk of slides. I will just give you a couple more slides, just a few, so that we, you can, um, you know, have an early night off. Or, or 8 o'clock and go back to the group meeting. They're probably talking about. <laughs> okay, okay. I underestimate how much I can talk, right? <laughs> so actually, I can talk for an hour. Okay, but I'll end off today by sharing a concept that our group has been very actively working on now. Um, and and I felt that this is actually more interesting than discovering a reaction. You can see that we are very active in designing chiral cations. And if you summarize, if you put all the chemistry that can be done with chiral cations and classify them according to the N ion that they use, then you get this kind of organization, right? You get, you get a reaction that we use hydroxides, carbonates, and so on, 
and you can categorize them under here, inorganic bases. And then we have a second category in which you have other inorganic salts like cyanide, iodide, or even the SN2X reaction that I just described is thiol carboxylates, carboxylates, blah, blah, blah. Traditionally, I show you the, sl the slide on phase transfer reaction, right? Traditionally, if you describe or discuss phase transfer reaction with an organic chemist, in their mind immediately, they just zoom in on this category of phase transfer. Oh, you're talking about uh, Marocca catalyst or single alkyl catalyst, and the reaction is generally just alkylation reaction using hydroxide carboxylate and so on. That's this category. But phase transfer catalyst or ion pair catalysis can be a lot more. Because if you use different kind of N ion, you can actually do many, many, many reactions, including using metal oxides or metal species, metal N ions. Then the chemistry can expand by 100 times, 1,000 times. So, the chemistry that we do now is actually a very, very small fraction of all the possible chemistry up here. I could say maybe a thousand times bigger than just this one because you can put different, different categories. And our lab has shown that it works for metal oxides and hypervalence decade. I'll just show you one or two more slides and then I'll stop. I'll just tell you one reaction that we all know. Okay. Potassium permanganate. You have used this reaction before in your undergraduate laboratory, I think, or even high school laboratory, right? You use uh, the purple solution, potassium, uh, you know, uh, permanganate, and then you oxidize some compound, right? Okay. You can actually use it in a phase transfer condition using chiral ion and potassium permanganate and do a dihydroxylation reaction on an alkene. And it's been demonstrated by Professor Brown, okay, many years ago. But in this situation, he used one equivalent of the catalyst, and then you get still very poor U and okay in endoselectivity. The main reason is because this catalyst is not stable under the strongly oxidizing condition. So what we did was to use our base coordinate catalyst, which we designed and built, okay, which is very easy to make. I think everyone in your lab can make it, and even exchange students can make it in two weeks. Christina, right? <laughs> okay, and Chang Xing also. I think in two weeks you can make it very easy. Okay. We showed that this base coordinate catalyst can be used to can use to control and metal and iron salt to undergo the hydroxylation reaction with good EE and good EO. Okay, I think there's a lot more slides on this topic and, and I'll stop here. And you're interested to find out more, I'm very happy to share with you later, uh, right after the lecture. For, with that, I would then go right to acknowledgement. <laughs> Actually, this is a, a, a bridge version because I have actually a lot more. I think I can talk for an hour, one hour, maybe, or even two hours. I want to go to the, our group picture, which was taken about a year, 12 months, of, uh, you know. I think a lot of the uh, students in our group has actually left. Now the lab, the, the, the lab is about half the size. Okay. I think I would then just tell you who did the SN2X reaction. Right? The SN2 reaction was done by this graduate student, Zhang Xing, and then uh, the postdoc, uh, Qing Yun. So both of them are responsible for the SN2X reaction, and uh, both of them are not here today. Anyway, thank you very much for, you know, to them, very active, very smart group. You know, everyone worked extremely hard. And I also like to thank um, uh, funding agency NUS, NTU, ASTAR, GSK, NMRC. And I have a history of working very well with computational chemists. But I'm very um, 
what's that called? Uh, promiscuous is the word. <laughs> with in, in selecting my partners. So I work with a lot of computation. So Richard Wong is from NUS, and then I also work with Professor Hajime. Um, he used to be in NTU, but now moved to Hong Kong also. Uh, Richard for NUS, and Professor Andy Huang is now in Kaohsiung and enrichment. So I have a, a variety of uh, uh, partners for computational work. But but their contribution is extremely important because it helps us understand our reaction very much. So I'd like to end by thanking you for your attention and thanks for coming to a late lecture. And I hope uh, you enjoy uh, this lecture. Thank you very much. So it's a beautiful work, you know, for a science paper. So that, <laughs> it's a really new, but it, it also, you know, make me think of, you know, another text, you know, the reaction in textbook. Uh -huh. So hydroboration, you know, the, the you know, hydroboration, oxidation, right? So which, you know, undergo like also three member ring transition state. Uh -huh. LKO group migrate with an empty charge, right? uh -huh. and if the LKO group is chiral. So the retention will be the case. Right? Hydroboration, right? Hydroboration. Okay. Yeah. If the R group, you know, the IOP car centers is R, you product. I can pass hard. you some candies you can try. It's, it's <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a textbook correction already. So I just I, you know, I want to know so yours and this one. Any analogy of that? Hydroboration uh, on an alkene. And then the LQ group will migrate from boron to oxygen. LQ group will migrate from boron to, to oxygen. We use hydroboration. Hydro My understanding is alkene, oxidation. right? Hydro, huh? Yeah, hydroboration oxidation. Oh, the second step. Second step. The second step, the yes. oxidation. Yes. You get a bor boron O peroxo minus, and then the R migrate to From oxygen. To oxygen. And then? The transition state is a three member ring yeah. with, negative charge, with a negative charge. Right? Another case is a bare villager. So, oxidation of ketone with per acid. So, uh -huh. which undergo? You know, uh -huh. a positively charged memory species. I think in general you can control this kind of mm. N ionic transition state with a chiral cation and you can then influence the outcome yeah. of the reaction. I think this is the general statement and we have shown also in the past of our catalyst controlling mm. brook wheel arrangement reaction yes. you, through a hypervalent silicate in which the silicon part is also a negative charge. So I think in general you can control any kind of n ionic intermediate or transition state using chiral ion, mm. and then and then to control the result of the migration. Yeah. So I think all these examples that you mentioned yeah. are all possible. Yeah. yeah. So that's why this one could be another textbook lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. The SN2X reaction work for other nucleophiles and electrophiles. Like, if you just have a type uh, carboxylate instead of hydroxylate, or if okay. you replace the CN and the bromide with another electronegative group. Okay. So, so um, I didn't show all the results from the paper. So this example I show is only the formation of a C sulfur bond, and in the paper itself, we have shown example that we added an azide, which is a CM bond. And then this boy here, okay, Chang Xing can raise my hand. <laughs> he has is gonna complete a work on the formation of CO bond. Okay, and then Fan uh, is here. Okay, so another guy in our lab has now shown that we can make CC bond. So CC bond is also possible now. On the other side, 
you need an electrophile that can stabilize the anion. So at this moment, you need two electron withdrawing groups. So you saw that there's one cyanide and one ester. So at this moment, we still cannot escape from having electron withdrawing group, at least two. So our hope in the future is to try to reduce number of electron withdrawing groups so that we can expand the kind of substrate scope for the electrophile part. Thanks for your question. It's actually not, not basic. It's a good, good question. Okay. Okay. Chlorine is slower. It works, but it's slower. Uh, bromine works very fast. Sometimes the reaction is a bit messy. Because I think photochemically, I think light can also break the CI bond. So, so yeah. chlorine is slow, it works. Aldine is very fast and the products are a little bit more, you get a few more that you don't know what it is. Yeah. But in general, I think both can be possible to modulate. I think in some cases, when you have a difficult substrate, you can use iodine, and then when you're more active substrate, you can, you can lower, you, you can control it by using changing the, the chloride. I think in the future, you can modulate the reactivity by changing the, the halogen. This is a very good idea too. <laughs> Thank you. Drunk tonight <laughs> to celebrate the <laughs> bottle of wine. Thank you very much, Annie. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You want to keep your back in my office? Uh, okay.